So with that, everyone, if you can see me and hear me loud and clear, please mm -hmm. type yes in the chat box right now. Huh? If you can see or hear me loud and clear. Okay, thank you, Boonhao, Ryan, G Jimmy, and Zach. Okay, so I think most of you can hear and see me loud and clear. So, um, so before I move on, I'm going to just uh, talk a short introduction of how uh, I know about Kang Wei. So Kang Wei going, today I... going to present uh, to you uh, some slides of how he start investing when he was 15 mm -hmm. and uh, the lesson, the gains and the mistake that he make, he'll yeah. be sharing. So, so what happened is that in early 2000 and uh, I think in 2014, when we just started, just started yeah. fifth percent, right? Mm, yeah. So, so we are looking for writers to help us to write uh, inside our, our website itself. And I remember Adam was searching the Seeking Alpha and saw this writer writes very sound and logical uh, type of article so we, we and we know that he's a singaporean so we we wrote into him and asked him uh, do you want to meet up and have a chat mm -hmm. and all this and when when we met him up we were shocked because we didn't know he was a 16 years old boy at that part of time okay uh because to i think to go into Siki of mm -hmm. what's the age huh? actually it's 18 18 but, right. but then at that point they didn't need yeah. you to like submit your ic yeah after that after that they need to so yeah. so basically he gets somebody, yeah, he get somebody to submit yeah. the ic and at the time when he starts writing second of us when 15, um when i was 14 yeah. when he was 14 15 he started yeah. to write uh for seeking alpha so so and the the way he writes is very logical so we were shocked when we met him and when, when we start talking uh, sh uh he's sharing us about his journey and all this uh it really strike us because uh it is very resonate with the way how we actually invest and for me for 16 years old boy at the point at the point of time where i met him uh he speaks so logically until now we are still meeting it every year and he went to army and now he's waiting for his uh university yeah. uh, in smu mm -hmm. and and currently he's working as an intern in uh, the fifth person itself mm -hmm. so i uh, then i decided why don't you just share how do you actually get started in investing when you was uh 15 years old and and how you you done about it and uh, and he shared with me a lot of his uh good uh way of how he actually picked dividend companies so without further ado i think we're just going to move on and and share with him so in case you cannot come into the webinar don't worry we have a live feed on the facebook itself and also on the instagram so we also welcome you to uh, join us from there so if not uh, i'm going to move on to the slides mm -hmm. okay so if you can see the slides right now the fifth person slide please type yes in the chat box right now okay cool so i think uh we are we are good to go. So basically, what happened is that uh, we're going to he's going to present. He's going to talk about some companies. So as a usual disclaimer, whatever we going to share today is not a recommendation to buy or sell. Okay, it's for educational purpose. So let us hand over to Kang Wei. Okay. Yep. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I just want to share with you some of the uh, mistakes and lessons that I'm, I'm gonna um, that I've made over the past um, couple of years when I'm investing. Um, but first, I'm just gonna start like. Um, by talking about how I started. And so I actually started um, because of my hobby, which is in the field of numismatics, which is basically the collection of coins and paper money. Uh, as you can see there, this is just assorted coins and banknotes. But to me, that's why I always say that Kang Wei is a bit matured for his age <laughs> himself, because when I met him, he, he speaks exactly the same maturity as us. And come to the coin hobby is mostly for <laughs> older generation people do that. And he's... He's so young when he was 14, 15, he started collecting coins. <laughs> Actually, yeah. I, I started when I was seven. It's, it's just yeah. like I, I uh, love to like find out more yeah. about like different countries and all. Yeah. But anyway, a common question, you know, I get that is like, how exactly is this hobby related to investing, right? Because it's like coins and you normally focus on like, the designs and the denominations, but it's not obvious how it's related to investing. So actually, it my it all started when my father gave me this banknote for my seventh birthday. And so those of you who have been to the UK before, you recognize that this is a UK 20 sterling pound note. And you can see it's a pretty cool note. Um, uh, for me, when I held the note in my hand, I really could see all the intricacies, the details, mm -hmm. and also the, the shiny foil. But basically, in short, when I was seven, this note really um, made me in awe. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, when I look at the pound, I remember last time my dad used to like, one is to seven. Right? One to, okay, one to seven is, is really long ago. Yeah. But so when my father changed that note for me, the very natural thing to ask is, how much did you get it for? So what he did was he pointed me to the Forex exchange rates. And at that point of time, the sterling pound to Singapore exchange rate was 3.1, which, 
which means he got this note from the money changer for something like 62 bucks. But the trigger that actually led me into investing, it actually came much later because um, seven years later in 2012, when I actually went back to check the sterling pound exchange rates, I realized that the sterling pound had depreciated to just $2 per sing dollar. So that's a 35% depreciation in just seven years, which is like a horrible return, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, the note at that point was worth something like $40 from just $62, like seven years ago. So it, it, was, it was something that really horrified me because before that, I kept thinking, right, that if you kept a note for like a longer period of time, um, they appreciate in value because it's like some sort of a compensation for you holding the asset, right? Yeah. Um, but then I realized it wasn't the case. La. So I mean, you can look at Malaysia Ringgit, you know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so while reading up about this whole topic, right, it led me into um, realizing that there's another force, you know, that was acting on all the currency we hold, despite it being like sing dollars, okay. right? And that is inflation. And inflation in, in Singapore is pretty subdued because um, it's like single digit percent. We don't really realize it unless we, we go back and think about it. Like 20 years ago, the purchasing power of $50 is much, much more than, than mm -hmm. now, right? But so over long terms, uh, long periods of time, it actually erodes our buying power by, by quite a lot. So it was here that I realized that even though we all save money, um, we are sometimes not fully um, getting rewarded for our efforts. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to prove the point, I will just go back to 2012 when I first started. I actually want to search up some of the interest rates for some of my savings account. And the, my normal savings account was using 0.25% as mm -hmm. compared to 1% for a fixed deposit mm -hmm. and 5% for the interest rate, which means that even though I was saving mm -hmm. money every year mm -hmm. um, like that, I was still losing about like 4% of my purchasing yeah. power every single year. Yeah. So, so Just yeah. in case you think that 2012 is too recent, uh, he's actually 21 this year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, because we met him five years ago when he was 16. Yeah, so yeah. this is like, like um, uh, kind of the time that I started when thinking he just started of, uh, investing at yeah. this. Yeah. So anyway, this led me into investing. So um, because I read online, you know, that this is a really good way to combat inflation. And I think it has really proven to be something like that. Um, but before I actually go into what I actually started with the strategy, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what happened before. So it's actually before the seeking alpha time as well. Yeah. So um, before I started, I mean, at, at a point I was like 14, I had no money. So I started yeah. from like paper trading. Okay. And one of the things that immediately caught my attention was things like penny stocks. Okay. Because um, they had all, all these people touting penny stocks. They had a lot penny of penny like, stock in the US or in Singapore? In, in the US, which yeah, is yeah. Okay. actually much more dangerous than Singapore. Yeah, just in case you don't know, uh, Kang Wei invest mostly in the US. Yeah, I started once in the US because yeah. like most of the information was there. Yeah. So um, basically, in the US, when they were touting penny stocks, they, they give you a lot of, they sell you a lot of stories. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you get like insane returns, like a few times over the yeah, I always next hear few the years. stories. <laughs> or the company having a potential market of one trillion dollars or a few trillion dollars, and and basically they tout it as a way to increase your capital quick. Mm -hmm. But then I realized after that, right, that these kind of things are actually called pump and dump schemes, mm -hmm. where these companies touting the these penny stocks, they actually pick those low float penny stocks, mm -hmm. small cap, and then they invest in it. And okay. after that they try to tout it to get to investors' emotions, mm -hmm. get them to invest. Yeah. And then after that, after many investors are in, the stock price has gone up, yeah. they actually sell out at the expense yeah. of investors. So these yeah. are actually very, very yeah, dangerous Yeah, it's a very schemes. famous word called pump and dump. Uh, mm. We have it in Singapore many years ago uh, under this uh, company called Blue Bond. Blue Bond and Lion uh, Gold. That, that, that was a very... Uh, uh, how how pump and dump really works like. Uh. Actually, the guy was just charged today. I, yeah, mean, I read the charged, news. Yeah, just yeah. today, yeah. So I, I realized that these kind of things were was investing and I mean it was gambling and, and not exactly like investing that, that I was trying to find. Yeah. And I was actually pretty lucky because at that point, right, I was doing paper trading. I didn't use my real money because I didn't have much. So I actually didn't lose real money. This so part. when did you start uh, the real real money? I actually started in 2013. Uh, when you are when I was 15. 15. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. um, so I actually used before my 15, before 15, you are paper trading. Yeah, paper trading. About 14 years old, you was paper trading. Yeah. So 15, you are so, using the real money. Correct. Okay. I, I got my starting capital actually from from the my earning from seeking alpha, which okay. a couple yeah. of thousand dollars. So, interesting so then, for a 15 years old guy making money from seeking alpha, writing <laughs> article. Oh, that's that's cool, man. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, without further ado, I'll just go into the in, uh, investing technique. Okay. Just in case you don't know what seeking hmm. alpha, seeking alpha is a very very big uh 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 US site to they write about articles about different companies in the US market. Yeah. It's very very big. Okay. 
the analysis. Yeah, yeah the analysis. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll go into the strategy, and that is dividend growth strategy uh, investing. So this is method is actually at the intersection of the pure dividend method, yeah. in dividend investing, and also um, growth investing. Yeah. But so, why do you, why do you start off with dividend instead of like straight away to the the growth investing itself? Yeah. So um, I know there are a lot of different yeah. ways like value investing, mm -hmm. but for for me, right, first. Um, when, I, when I went into dividend growth mm -hmm. investing, is it really proves that the company is solid uh -huh. because um, if you can manage to pay dividend for so many years on end and still continue to increase the dividend, yeah. you are usually at the cream of the crop. Yeah, you're but, right. It's yeah. very hard for companies to actually continuously keep uh, increasing dividend unless their business model is very strong. You're right. Yeah. So oh, for you to 14, 15 years old can think of this <laughs> such thing as very good. It takes me quite some time to realize it. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah. but the, the more interesting thing that that the reason why mm -hmm. I attracted here is because it pays you a steadily growing stream of reliable and predictable dividends. Mm -hmm. And so um, during time of recession, I, I know that sometimes my emotions can get the better of me. Mm -hmm. So I think when I focus on dividends instead of like the gyrations of the stock market, mm -hmm. I, I am able to like hold on better. Yeah. But the most important reason why dividend growth investing was really appealing for me is its ability to supercharge your returns using this concept called compounding. And I'll just share with you a very um, inspiring quote from me. Um, this is actually by one of the greatest scientists of all time, Albert Einstein. He was in the compounding too. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see that he said, compounding interest is, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it, earns it, and he who doesn't pays it. So I think it's really true, right? Yep. If you know about compounding, you really want to, to use it yeah. for your investing and for your life. Yeah. But if you don't pay attention and you don't yes. know about compounding, you may very well be at the receiving end. Yeah. Like for example, to you, credit card debt may be, may be like a low interest yes. rate. But in, in reality, at a 20% yeah. interest, your, your debt will actually double yeah. in just three and a half years. Yeah. So, so I think basically what, what Kang Wei trying to tell you is that actually uh, when it comes to investing, right, is, is you must start as young as possible. Exactly. Yeah. Because when you start young, you, you don't need a lot of money to start, but compounding interest can build up your small amount of money to a very huge. Mm. But the later you start, let's say in the 50s or the 60s, and you want to build it up, uh, you need a large sum of money. Yeah, right? So right. I think that's the, the thing, the point that he's trying to uh, bring across itself. Mm. Okay, so um, I'll just talk a bit about dividend growth investing like, like the, and the kind of stocks that we usually find. Okay, so dividend growth investing, as I said, is an intersection between dividend investing, which is stable, slowly growing dividends over time, and growth investing, which is seeking pure capital appreciation. So when I'm talking about this method, I'm looking for resilient cash generating business with possible avenues for future growth. So I, I still need to have some, some growth. It has to be reinvesting some of the, mm -hmm. that, that income back into the business and resulting ultimately in growing dividends okay. for shareholders. Yeah, but, but the, the way he's sharing these methods that he just shared today, mm. right, is mostly, I think the US companies tend to fulfill this criteria, but the Asian companies, uh, oh, you must spend some time to find such companies mm. in the Asian market. Asian markets works very differently from the US market. Yeah? That's partially the reason why when I look at Singapore dividend stocks, I was like, wow, they all decreased the dividends <laughs> during the financial crisis. Yeah. But I think he was that... very smart that he started off in the US. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, I'll just go through one of the dividend stocks yeah. that I, I really like. It's Johnson & Johnson. You can look at it. You can see its dividend growth chart here. Mm -hmm. um, if you bought in 1972, um, you got like two cents of dividends, but now you're getting 90 cents a quarter. And the amazing thing about Johnson & Johnson is that it's grown its dividend for every single year over the past 50 over years. And for the 47 years in this chart, it's mm -hmm. grown every single year as well. And you can look at the, the highlighted part of that graph, those are the recessions. And even through the 2008-09 recession, J&J actually raised its dividends twice when everybody was, yeah. was in trouble. So you can see that its business model is really resilient. Yeah. And I'll just talk a little bit about uh, its business So um, and, and how it's so resilient, mm -hmm. right? So the first thing is that it sells consumer products at its first segment. Um, it has oral care, personal care, beauty products under things like Listerine, Neutrogena, and J&J itself. And this kind of brands, right, they've really built a very strong customer base over the years, and that gives it a lot of brand equity. Mm. Um, and more, and you, you, and we also don't stop using this kind of products during recession, right? Because we still need yeah. like soap, mouthwash, etc. If I talk about mouth, mouthwash, I always talk about Listerine, that's all. Yeah, Listerine yeah, is the, like, That's the brand that's always it, it's my like mind. share yeah. of mine, right? <laughs> And, and and those of course the baby powders people are using the, but you don't talk about the recent case, <laughs> recent case that they have all that yeah but in the true. past we we all all use uh, Johnson and Johnson and uh, for the babies and all this stuff. Mm. 
And, uh, but, but a larger part of its um, income actually comes from its medical segment, okay. which includes, um, which offers products like for orthopedic procedures and also surgical devices for surgery. So, so what you're telling me that this two is the largest revenue contributor? Um, this one and the next one, which is pharmaceuticals. Oh, I didn't know. I always thought that they're consumer Yeah, it seems like it's always yeah, a consumer yeah, product yeah. Oh, company. Okay, okay, that's something interesting. Okay. Yeah, so all these things, right, um, people will need, whether it's in good times or yeah. bad times, right, because of this like forceps, ligature yeah. needles or like, uh, procedures for joint replacement and clavicle yeah. fractures, they, they, they happen. Yeah. But actually, there's one part of um, JNJ's revenues that's a bit more cyclical, and that's the pharmaceutical okay. products. Because um, as, we, as we all know, you know, um, pharmaceutical products, uh, companies, they their revenues are very reliant on their pipeline, mm -hmm. and they may take a hit when, when the patents expire. Mm -hmm. But the good thing for JNJ is that they have demonstrated really the ability to maintain a very strong pipeline over the years. And also a large percentage of their revenues come from drugs that are difficult to manufacture. Mm. So um, for those who don't know, drugs um, who, that are produced in the US, they usually have a patent once they are approved that lasts for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So when patents expire, all the generic competition will start coming in and then they will try to slash, slash, the, the, price, slash yeah. the price so yeah. that they can make a profit. Yeah. And that means that the original company, they cannot earn as much. Yeah. But the drug that you see here on the screen is actually called Remicade it treats autoimmune diseases. And even though the patent has expired, it is still um, having a 90% market share in the US. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh. And that's because there's not a big difference between the price of generic and original products. And it's because this drug is really complex to make. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really like it, you know, that J&J &J is into this kind of drugs. Mm -hmm. And also they've really uh, mm -hmm. shown the ability to maintain a strong pipeline. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the reason why um, it's so resilient and it's been able to pay consistent dividends over time. And going back to the chart, now I'm actually plotting it mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of percentage change. And you can see that um, if you bought J&J &J shares in 1972, and for the amount of shares, let's say you earn, you um, got $100 in dividends. Mm -hmm. But for the, now for the same amount of shares, you're getting $4,300 of dividends, which is an increase of 43 times. Okay. And that doesn't even think to appreciate the, 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 the share consideration, price of, share the share price appreciation, appreciation. right? So I think you can see how compounding mm. really works in your favor. Mm. But there's actually one way to supercharge your returns. Mm. Um, and that is reinvestment of the dividends. Mm -hmm. So I'll just do a very simple exercise, right, to show you the power of reinvestment and why this really drew me into um, dividend growth investing. Okay. So let's assume that you are <clears throat> just starting out 30 years old and you have an initial capital of $10,000. And a typical dividend growth stock, right, will pay you about 3% a year. Mm -hmm. and then I assume that this dividend growth stock over its um, run will pay you 8% year a year dividend growth and will produce 6% capital appreciation. And this, mm. these are very standard numbers. Mm. You know, 8% is like the average one portfolio. Mm. And for 6%, that's actually the performance of the Dow Jones over mm. the past 50 years. Mm. Right. So uh, in the first year, you get 300 bucks. Okay. Right? You can see here. And let's say you don't reinvest the dividends. Every year you take a dividends, mm -hmm. um, you you spend it elsewhere, you take it out of the portfolio. Mm -hmm. And at the end of 30 years, you actually, the dividend that you get is actually $2,795 mm -hmm. based on this scenario. Mm -hmm. And that is a 27% you cost. I mean, it's not yeah. bad, right? Not so bad, not so bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not so but um, let's, let's look at the scenario where you reinvest invest dividends. Dividend, okay. So the amount that you get is 7,441. It's 74% you cost. Okay. So you can really see the difference, yeah. you know. The difference, the gap uh, is actually quite big uh, between the 20 over percent and the 70 over percent. That's a 50, about a 50 percent uh, difference. And, and, mm. we, and this gap uh, can make a very, very big difference in your portfolio. So actually the key to really grow fast in investing uh, is that you must not spend your dividends. Okay, if you are young, you, you should keep the dividend and reinvest it. Exactly. But of course, if you are uh, later part in your life, you are older, you are retired, then of course you take the dividends and spend and build up uh, maybe uh, use it for your lifestyle and all this, okay? So it depends on which age you are in at that point of time, yeah? Hmm. So for a long time, right, I've actually really stuck to dividend growth investing. I was not open to new ideas. Mm -hmm. But then one day as I was just reading up and just pondering, I, I was like, given my age and my time horizon, I think I can mm -hmm. go for a strategy that actually gives me a little bit more returns. Yeah. And so I actually went, um, I'm actually venturing out into value growth investing. Yeah. This so is pretty new. To I think years. that was also one of the, probably the, the one question that I asked Kang Wei yeah, back exactly. then in 2014 is like, you are so young, why do you do uh, dividend investing? But of course, he's, he's, at that point of time, I didn't try to change his thinking, but he was saying that it's, it's the safest way to uh, 
to invest, okay? Yeah, I, I think uh, for me, yeah, it was really called yeah, the compounding. Yeah. I really just had that in mind. Yeah, but I think he did it. He did the right way because he throughout the years, I think he you build you build up the knowledge and the know how. You mm. make some mistake along, but you make lesser mistake when you do dividend, right? That, but that if, if he were to start in value growth investing, right, mm. uh, probably he go he going to make more mistake as compared to when he was uh, buying the dividend itself because the value growth investing companies they got. There are no deviance. Mm. So you really have to have a very clear understanding of the business model itself. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So I'll just go a bit into value growth <laughs> investing. Um, I'm looking for things with long running for growth, mm -hmm. um, able to scale easily. That's something that the fifth person here has been have been really talking about. Yep. And at a fair price relative to its growth potential. Mm -hmm. So um it seems different from dividend growth investing, but actually when I thought about it, actually it's kind of the same. Mm -hmm. Because for um, different growth stocks, mm -hmm. compounding happens in your portfolio. Mm -hmm. And for value growth stocks, the compounding basically happens in the companies. And if this company is a really good business, mm -hmm. they can reinvest all their profits mm -hmm. at a very high return on investment, then you're going to see uh, a lot more compounding happen in the company than yeah. if it were to happen in your portfolio. And that's main, mainly the thing yeah. why, I, why I, you know, okay. shifted. So to, 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 to say what he just explained right, is basically that if you were to do dividend investing, right, you are the capital located itself. You have to keep finding good companies and redeploy your dividends itself. But for the value growth investing, basically you let the company compound itself. Mm. So basically you just buy and let it compound and you no need to worry about it because the company itself can continue keep con continuously compound. So it's less, generally it will be say less work. Right? Just let mm. the people do the job for you. In, uh. in a way, yeah. yeah. So my current allocation is actually 40% dividend growth. Um, I've going in a little into value growth mm -hmm. but mostly cash because i've actually sold a couple of different growth stocks i'll explain why in a short while um but for now my my target allocation eventually is to move out a little bit more div uh, from dividend growth and expand a little bit more into value growth mm -hmm. investing because i think that's the, the the right area for me to be in now so on the surface you know everything here looks perfect yeah. right that all the strategy yeah. or the theory looks yeah. well thought out but in reality, right, my investing journey has really been far from perfect. Yeah. So I just want to share some of the lessons that I've learned yeah. with you. And hopefully, you know, you, you, you learn from them as well. Mm -hmm. You'll find something that, that you can take away from this, um, from these things I'm going to share. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm going to split my, my mistakes into two different kinds. Emotions, um, related mistakes, and also mm -hmm. mistakes related to judgment. So let's go first into emotions. Um, the first mistake was letting noise get to me. So um, this is basically letting the media chatter and letting the distractions mm -hmm. get to me. And what I did was actually, um, I, I, I think you guys know that I started investing back in 2013 uh, with my uh, father's account. And then um, one year later in 2014, the market has performed really, mm -hmm. really well. I think it's a 30 something percent yeah. growth. And then just so, right after the euro debt crisis. Yeah, right after. So it's recovering. So, it was yeah. doing so well. It was one of the best years on record. Yeah. And then I started reading articles where you see the red dot is at 2014 um, about how a double mm -hmm. top is coming, the market's facing resist resistance, and that there may be a market correction. Okay. So this kind of things, right, really, really impacted me. And then I was like, okay, I, mm -hmm. I've had I've had these profits. So should I should I sell out? So actually I went to some of my relatives and asked, and they, what they said is that. If you think that there's a recession coming, mm. the best thing to do is, is just sell, which, which yeah. makes sense. And so what I did was I sold a lot of my stocks, um, except those that I thought would do well in the recession. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I'm glad that I kept those that, okay. I, that I, I had and I kept, right? Yeah. Because those have turned out to be my best performers. Yeah. And for those that I sold, it's mm -hmm. led me to miss out on a lot of the very good returns. Okay. So for me, the main takeaway is that um, we're always looking to sell before a downturn. Yeah. Right? But it's really not possible when you think about yeah. it. So we shouldn't exactly be trying to always guess like when the downturn is coming oh. because you might end up missing out on a lot of gains. It's better off looking for just the, the good businesses yeah. and then really holding them through the downturns oh. and maybe even buying more. So always holding out cash. Yeah, I think this is a rather very, very common mistake that I think most investor, right? Any investor will definitely go through this mistake. Even personally, I also did go through this mistake. Mm. So, so uh, we are always trying to predict where the market is going to move, yeah. but instead of just focusing whether, hey, I'm, am I holding a good business? If I'm holding a good business, why do I sell? It's just like if you, if you buy a good business, because now the problem is that you never control the cash flow, so you, mm. you may want to sell the business. Mm. But if you are the person who, let's say, you you physically, let's say, owns this company, let's say, uh, maybe Brad Talk or, or, mm. or maybe uh, Johnson & Johnson, let's say you really own Johnson & Johnson, and you every year you can take the cash flow. 
Yeah. You know what I think of selling? Yeah, somebody sell you a high, uh, get you a high price. Do you want to sell? No, uh, mm. if you sell, you lost your cash flow. And when you lost your cash flow and the market down, right, you got no cash flow to buy into stocks, right? So you have to treat stocks in uh, in this way also. Yeah, like you're owning the businesses yeah, right. actually, right? So um, the next mistake that I made that um, is procrastinating instead of buying. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm going to share this um, interesting idea of in, in 2013, this was a, actually mm-hmm. a pretty obvious opportunity to buy. And this company was is actually called Lockheed Martin. Yeah. It's the world's largest defense contractor. So it produces fighter aircraft like F-22, okay. F-35, F-16. And that comes from most of its revenues. Mm-hmm. But the, the, the smaller part of its revenues actually come from like combat ships, naval electronics, mm-hmm. missiles, and space systems. So all these things are, are really required by governments mm-hmm. around the world for that, that defense. And so um, you can see in this chart, right, mm-hmm. that in 2013, it was actually trading at a t- PE of 10. And the four P was actually like nine. Okay. And this company was was still growing. You know that there's so it's really... a re- recurring company contracted and all this, right? Yeah, exactly. So then you, you could look at it's mm. the, the amount of money that is contracted, okay. and then and then that would be like its future revenues, right? Yes. Yeah. So that's pretty obvious. But then at that point, right, there's this thing called the fiscal cliff. I'm not okay. sure if you remember. It's basically yeah. talk about the impending US debt ceiling that yeah. will that will kind of limit cost. Okay. I mean limit spending on defense. Okay. But then actually, if you think about it, right, mm-hmm. if one if you base it on past US actions, mm-hmm. what they do is normally they just increase the debt ceiling mm-hmm. to accommodate more spending and not the other way around. Okay. So actually Lockheed Martin's business would not actually be affected. But at that point, right, it was such an attractive price, seemed like a no-brainer. Mm. But I was like, what if the, the stock drops more? Or what if this is the market mm-hmm. repricing the stock? Mm-hmm. Or what if there's something like I don't know? So it was a lot of second guessing myself. Yeah. Well, of course, a 10 time PE for a 10 time PE with recurring strong contract. Are they market leader or? Yeah, yeah, they are yeah, more yeah. or less a market leader. They're market leader. It's like an oligopoly. I think it's, it's really, I think it's a, like a buffer type of company. Yeah, exactly. It's like, like, wow, it's like, it's value for money. And this one is actually also a dividend growth stock. That's okay. why I was actually looking at it. Okay. So interested. It okay. actually raised a dividend for like 20 over years in, okay. in consecutively. Yeah. So, what I learned from this is that you know I should have just um, bought it when when I thought that it was a fair price. That from this price to its mm-hmm. intrinsic value, if, if if it returns there, I would get a good return, right? Mm-hmm. I should have just thought about that and got into the stock mm-hmm. instead of just uh, like second guessing myself yeah. and like mm-hmm. doubting is this the bottom? Yeah. yeah. So I think you can see a really a common yeah. thread between my yeah. my two mistakes. It's really about trying to yeah. time the market, right? Yeah. Yeah, so but actually I'm quite surprised hmm. that all this are uh, your you self learned it yourself. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, it, I, it, it yeah. took some like, reflection, yeah. uh, reflection. But it's good that you 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 make all these small mistakes when you are much younger, I would say. <laughs> like, so now when you hit your 21, you you got a long runway to run because you already know what company you want to pick, what stock you want to buy, hmm. what kind of business model is good. This right. mistake you already make when you are in the 14, your 15, your 16, and, and it's all over already, and you really learn from all these lessons. Hmm. Like, so, okay, I'll just share with you the performance of Lockheed Martin mm. since then. And you can see that it's been like a yeah, three so or four bagger. Or three or four bagger for your bought. Yeah, uh, so okay. 80 over dollars now is 296. Okay. So you can see the fantastic performance of Lockheed yeah. Martin after the market repriced it. Yeah. Right. So basically, if you find a good business, uh, good management, you're selling at a good price, you don't care about the uh, macro, the, macro, the news, yeah, the macro just news. focus on the bottom up approach, uh, value for money. Just go and get it and yeah, yeah don't procrastinate to buy. Yeah. Mm, because when the news comes out, right, yeah. usually right, that means it's really late into the cycle. Uh-huh. And then it's already like normally maybe tr- going to you know uh-huh. recover. It's, it's okay. gonna be like a cyclical recovery uh-huh. as well. That, that's when the media really takes uh-huh. advantage. So yeah, that's another thing to, to learn, I guess. Uh-huh. Um my next mistake is actually actually it's quite a common one. Okay. It's actually deviating from the okay. strategy. So I mm-hmm. think back in like 2013-14, mm-hmm. I was talking to Victor about like gold yeah. and natural resources. Yeah. When, we, when I first met him, he also talked about gold. Yeah, and all this. exactly. Yeah. So um, I, because I read a lot of articles about yeah. the attractiveness of this kind of asset mm-hmm. because they were like beaten down mm-hmm. and then the sentiment was bad. Mm-hmm. And then there was a lot of like quantitative easing. So they really yeah. took advantage of the, the fact that it was quantitative easing. Yeah. And, it, and then they, they went to talk about, you know, gold. Yeah. That gold is going to like skyrocket in value yeah. uh, soon. So... What I, I did was was to read up a little bit more about gold uh, funds and stuff. And I found this fund called the Gumco Global Gold Natural Resources and Income mm-hmm. Fund. And this fund, actually, the performance over the past five years at that point was actually very bad. It was like negative 60%. Okay. But then I was like, okay, it's, it's because this is industry is in a cyclical downturn mm-hmm. and it's going to recover soon. Mm-hmm. 
So um, I, I actually found, I actually look at the dividend, it's 144. Then I went to the share price, it's 1005. And that gives me a dividend of 14.3%. Mm -hmm. So that is actually yes, a very attractive It's a very, very attractive dividend, yeah, you, right? Yeah. So I was like, wow, this is something that I like, a sector mm -hmm, that I like. Mm -hmm. And then it can really increase the mm -hmm. dividend of my portfolio. So I was like, yeah, I, I, I really want to go into this. And I went into the stock, uh, ignoring mm -hmm. the fact that the funds had actually decreased its dividend before. Okay. And also the past performance was not very okay. good. Like, I mean, we're talking about it. Mm -hmm. So eventually, um, after buying this mm -hmm. uh, fund, I did, it actually reduced the dividends mm -hmm. twice more over okay. the next one and a half years. Obviously, because the, the companies held in this fund, they, they were also paying less okay. dividends. As so the yellow, the orange color line is the dividend. The orange color is the dividend. The blue and the color blue line is the, is the price. price. So basically, exactly. from this chart, it's very simple. Already. If a company decreases the dividend, there's a very high chance they decrease the share price. Yeah. The share price decreases. So exactly. that's, you say decrease dividend, decrease share price. Huh? Yeah. So then um, for me, after the two dividend cuts, I was like, I think this is really a mistake. I shouldn't yeah. have gotten yeah. into this fund. Mm -hmm. And I bailed out the fund at $7.60 from 10.05 just now. Okay. So that's about a 20% loss. But okay. luckily the dividends that I collected is about mm -hmm. 180. So the loss was about 8% like after okay. commissions. Yeah. Not so bad like, to make uh, to learn a lesson. Yeah, exactly. Just lost 8% to learn. <laughs> I lost 50% to learn, learn a lesson. Yeah. But anyway, a uh, few lessons here. Obviously, the first lesson is never deviate from the strategy, right? Because my strategy was to look for really mm -hmm. solid, yeah. resilient dividend yeah. stocks with growth potential yeah. that can raise dividends over yeah. time and not something that is cyclical and just like cutting yeah. its dividends, yeah. stuff like that, right? And more, more, more if you talk about gold, they don't generate any cash flow out of it. There's no, mm -hmm. there's, uh, you put a gold out there, 20 years later, it's still the same old gold. Right. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. But and then these were also like um, gold mining stocks. Yeah. And then when, as gold price fell, they, they are their profits actually, they yeah. all went into losses like, basically. Yeah. So they really couldn't um, hold those dividends yeah. as well. And the second lesson actually from mm -hmm. here, I just want to share, is also never chase you. Okay. I mean yeah. like 14% you, it, it really looks Attractive. too it's good really to be attractive, true, right? Yeah. I think most people get stuck up to it. Like. Yeah, like, like me. <laughs> yeah. So when it's too good to be true, it probably isn't. Uh, yeah. yeah. So that's the end of emotions. I'm now going into um, lessons from judgment. So judgment basically means that these mistakes were made basically because, yeah. because of my inexperience yeah and so the first mistake i made was actually selling a great business okay and this business is called the trade desk mm -hmm. i sold it when the price doubled mm -hmm. but after that it actually performed exceedingly well because this is simply such a good business so i'll just go into a bit of details about the trade desk the trade desk is actually a company mm -hmm. in the programmatic advertising space so what it does is it helps advertisers maximize their return mm -hmm. on investment through selecting advertising inventory that best suits their needs mm -hmm. and their requirements. So I won't go to, into too much details about this. You can read up our company on your own, but um, there's a couple of key factors that make this company such a great business. Mm -hmm. Firstly, it's a platform business, okay. right? So it is massively, massively scalable. Mm -hmm. The incremental cost of um, having one more user mm -hmm. use the platform is really, is really small. Mm -hmm. Ex um, the only cost that they have is just extra web hosting costs, right? Okay. Which, which they have to just buy um, data centers over time. Okay. And besides this, it actually enjoys network effects. Okay. Um, it, it's one of the biggest independent uh, programmatic advertising business, mm -hmm. and it actually provides clients with over 600 billion daily advertising mm -hmm. impressions. So impressions mm -hmm. are counted every time you refresh a website and you view an ad on the website. So there's 600 billion of these for, for mm -hmm. clients okay. to choose from. And also it is a, it's, very unprecedented in the way that it allows customers to build custom APIs on the platform. Okay. And it's something that the competitors never did because mm -hmm. of, of some concerns, like security concerns mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But but they have just upped the security and they did this and now it's contributing to this 95% customer retention rate, which okay, is super high. That's very high. 95% yeah. is super high. Huh? Yeah, and the best thing is, right, this programmatic advertising industry is growing at a, like a 20% clip. Okay. Yeah, because it, it's... Uh, it's, it's using big data yeah. to decide on what inventory, advertising inventory yeah. to buy. I think the future is in the big data. Like. I think everybody's talking about uh, data science and yeah. all this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So even if Trade Desk does not grow its market share, which mm -hmm. I, I think it will, mm -hmm. it's already growing at 20% uh, growth rate. Okay. So, so it, it's, it's really like a no-brainer at this yeah. point when, when, it's in, when it's in the cheap market. Okay. So what I did was in, in May 2018, I was really lucky to find this company mm -hmm. um, at about $50 a share. 
Okay. And after doing a discounted cash flow valuation, okay. I realized that it's valued about 60 bucks. Mm -hmm. So realizing it was undervalued and mm -hmm. this is such a good company, yeah. I just bought in. Yeah. And and so like a few days after I bought in, there was an earnings report mm. and the and the price actually shot up by like 40, 50 percent one okay. day. And I was really happy, right? I mean, yeah. it's the first time it's worked out so fast. Yeah. But then it just continued increasing and increasing and okay. increasing. And as I revalued the company, I realized that 60 increased to 70. Mm -hmm. But as it hit like 90 over, right, I was mm -hmm. like, why wow, is it getting a bit out of hand? Because it's 30 percent above fair value. Mm -hmm. So I was like thinking that the run cannot continue. So okay. I, I just sold my entire stake in the trade desk. Okay. So note that this was like purely a technical reason. It was nothing to do with the trade desk fundamentals. Okay. It was just because I thought it was expensive. Yeah. So something that I learned with this kind of high growth companies is oh. that um, mm -hmm. if they're growing very, very fast, right? Mm -hmm. The valuation mm -hmm. actually grows very rapidly as well. Because yeah. now um, you see trade desk is trading at 200 mm -hmm. over dollars. Mm -hmm. If I never sold, I would have uh, made like a five, a four time my return, right? Yeah. And my current valuation of this stock, I actually refresh it every quarter. It's yeah. currently about $120. Yeah. So you can see that it's really increased so fast, right? Mm. But I, my, my, my thinking is that actually when it comes to buying a great business, you know that it's a growing industry and you buy at the right price, I think you, it's best mm. that you continue to hold because the industry itself is still growing in, in terms of the, the, the nature itself. And a lot of times when we do, we investors do valuation is usually based on the historical data. Mm. And historical data doesn't tell you the future. The business can be keep continuously doing well, right? Mm. So we have to factor in these things. So that's why you find a great business. Uh, they have a low and long runway, very good industry that's growing, and you buy at the right price, continue for it. Yeah, exactly. So I'm still waiting for my chance to re-enter yeah. trade desk. Okay. <laughs> of course, trade desk is expensive right now. Yeah, it's very expensive, 100 times mm. PE. Yeah. But this is something that definitely should keep on your watch list. Yeah. And my next mistake is actually holding an over leveraged business. Okay. So I actually did not hold this company, Kinder Morgan, directly. Okay. I actually own one of their subsidiaries. It okay. was a really good dividend paying stock. Mm -hmm. And actually what Kinder Morgan did was to buy out this subsidiary. So I was given um, part cash, part stock. So okay. I, I had some Kinder Morgan stocks there. Okay. So I'm just going to tell you a bit about Kinder Morgan. It's actually one of the largest oil and gas pipelines mm -hmm. in the United States. And according to recent numbers, 40% mm -hmm. of US gas mm -hmm. flows through Kinder Morgan pipelines mm -hmm. one time or another. Mm -hmm. And this is actually a really business that is, is really required, right? Uh. Because US is so large and everyone needs gas to produce mm -hmm. electricity. Yeah, you're right. Right. And and those areas that actually drill gas, mm -hmm. they're actually very limited. There are only a few parts in the United mm -hmm. States. And you need this kind of pipeline to transport the gas and the oil okay. over to the entire country. Mm -hmm. So and, and I think you can see already that this business, right, is is very stable mm -hmm. with recurring revenues. Mm -hmm. And so has a white mode, right? Because um, there's a lot of regulation uh, around this uh, kind of business. The authorities will, will really read up about it. Uh, will do a lot of research mm -hmm. and, and decide whether they can build the pipeline there mm -hmm. because of environmental concerns. Okay. And the other thing is that it's very costly to build. So not everyone can just come in and try to build a pipeline, right? Um, and of course, this is a needed service. So what happened to Kinder Morgan um, is that it's, okay, you know, Morgan's earnings were actually increasing mm -hmm. over time mm -hmm. because it's a very stable business, mm -hmm. right? And what it did is before the crisis, they took advantage of this position. Mm -hmm. They went on an acquisition spree. That's mm -hmm. how they, they acquired the company that I own. Okay. And because of this, they accumulated debt of okay. uh, debt to assets. That debt to assets um, ratio was 50%. Okay. And the debt to equity was three. Okay. And at the same time, right, they promised increasing dividends over time yeah, huh? at a 10 percent clip from 2014 then to 2020 okay so i think you can see why mm. this is a bit dangerous at this yeah. point even though this is a very stable very strong business yeah and that's because the oil price crashed um in 2014 i think everyone of, of us were blindsided we yeah, didn't okay. expect that to happen yeah the oil price crashed from 100 dollars to just 40 dollars mm -hmm. and it took a toll on kinder morgan's cash flows because it of course this is a very solid business mm -hmm. but when all its customers are doing badly it can't command okay. as much and as as oil prices and gas prices were, were, were crashing some of some of the gas and the oil from some of the areas right mm -hmm. they were actually stopping production so it, it resulted in less revenues for them so what happened was that they had to they for, for that kind of a debt mm -hmm. load the investors and all the uh, rating companies, they were they were not sure whether David, the, the Kinder Morgan could mm -hmm. continue um, paying its dividend while mm -hmm. paying off its debt. Okay, and that was and 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 their concerns, you know, yeah. proved to be right, la. 
um, because in 2016, they had to cut their dividend by 75%. Okay. So same thing, you look at the chart, uh, the I think the red one is the, the red one dividend, is the dividend, dividend, the share price is the blue one. And the uh, debt to assets is actually yeah. the yellow one. So the basically, you cut your dividend, you, the share price decrease. Huh? Very yeah. common. Exactly. Mm. So um, luckily, I didn't lose as much money mm -hmm. as as, um, as as you see here mm -hmm. because I, I saw on the way down and mm -hmm. also Kinder Morgan paid a pretty tidy price yeah, for okay. the company, the company that owned. Yeah, okay. But anyway, this is something that I, we, yeah. we, we should learn, right? Yeah. So so not so bad for him to start off, you know, doing dividend investing, make some mistake over there, then get to become a, a small smarter investor. Yeah. Okay. But so if he started off straight away in value growth, he probably going to make more mistake because there's a lot of the companies don't pay dividend like what I said. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and just a very quick side note on insider purchases. Mm. One reason why I bought Kinder Morgan okay. was actually because the CEO, Richard Kinder, he was, mm. he was continually buying the shares. Okay. And you can see here, he actually bought over 50 million US dollars worth of shares. Oh, that's a lot of money. 50 over, million. Yeah. Uh -huh. Over the two years. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so this, this basically highlights that mm. while insider buying is really good, it does not mean Insider alone, inside of buying alone, yes, means mean make it mean that it's, it's a undervalued. good buy. Yeah, yeah it's a good yeah. buy. Okay, so you have to look at the insider's track record as well. Yeah, but more importantly, right? I think we should really analyze each stock and find out whether it's worth our money before yeah, buying. So if the if the insider is buying when we view that the stock is undervalued, then you can be a correct thing. But if you yeah. view the stock is overvalued and yet the insider keep buying, right? Then probably the insider himself sometimes you must know there's a difference between a, a entrepreneur and a and a capital locator a capital locator know when to buy into a, a company but entrepreneur they they always believe that their business will do well so regardless yeah. of what price they'll they continue to keep buying and buying and buying and buying so yeah. just think no about it so right? after after all insiders are also human too right? yeah, yeah, and, and they might make mistakes yeah yeah and the, the next one is actually never extrapolate growth. Mm -hmm. So my mistake here was uh, was uh, twofold, you know. Okay. The first is I extrapolated growth, mm -hmm. which is this company's current year revenues based on its past growth. And but okay. but this company was actually one with lumpy and project based revenues. Okay. So for those who are unfamiliar with this talk, I actually written an article here on Fifth Person before uh -huh. on Hattonland. It's a property developer based okay. in Malacca, um, developing residential, hospitality, and commercial real estate. So what it does is it buys okay. the land, then it hires a contractor to help with mm -hmm. construction, and then it, it sells um it, the land right okay. to uh, I'm sorry the units, mm -hmm. and this company has very lumpy earnings mm -hmm. and revenues. You can see. Because um, mm -hmm. it depends on the percentage of the property completed okay. and the percentage of units sold, okay. and all these two factors, right, they rely on yeah. external factors. Yeah. So there's a lot of moving parts in this in this case, huh? Exactly. So in 2017, what I did was I based it off the 462.4 million here, okay. and I and I projected revenues, okay, uh, with the assumption that all these projects that management okay. has been really yeah. talking about um, will be completed within the next 10 yeah. years. Well, that's quite a lot of the upside, huh? Yeah, so yeah, basically, uh -huh. I considered all oh, the upside, upside but, but I didn't consider so the downside. Yeah, okay. And I mean, you know Murphy's Law, right? Yeah. Whatever that, that can yeah. happen, will happen. So right? when it comes to investing, is you don't always want to look in the upside. You also yeah. must focus. Actually, come to investing is always focus on the downside. If you if you can take care of the downside, the upside will take care by itself. Okay, don't look. If you are always looking at upside, yeah. Uh, it's as good as you always going to the uh, queuing up for the Toto and buying, <laughs> hoping to get the ten million dollar yeah. draw. Uh. Yeah. So okay. What happened here was because of the combination of mm -hmm. the lackluster buying interest due to the shelving of the mm -hmm. KL Singapore high speed mm -hmm. rail and also one of their projects getting delayed, mm -hmm. you can see that their sales really dropped that, off that's, that's in a 2019. Huge drop, right? yeah. um, actually, this is only six months of 2019, mm -hmm. but you can see it's already a drop of more than half. Yes, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I think you for this kind of companies, you should just probably avoid them. Yeah. But even if you're looking to invest in this kind of companies with very lumpy project-based earnings, you should not base your expectations yeah. on previous revenues and not even on, on what the management yeah. says, right? Yeah. So, so the interesting thing about Hatterland is I also noticed that they also opened some booth in the, I think, Suntech itself. Then they mm -hmm. was trying to sell uh, Malacca property in, yeah. in Singapore. But, but my take to always, uh, all these overseas developer coming to Singapore to sell uh, property, be it Bangkok property or, or India property or China or, what, or what, which, hmm. whichever country they sell. My thing is that if the property is very, very good, right? Uh, it will then sell it will sell off in the, the local side. It won't even come to the overseas. They come overseas because they, they can't sell it out. So for hmm. instance, uh, I recently I got a, an SMS from one of my friends telling me about this Bangkok uh, 
property projects. Mm. Eh. But but for me, is I understand the, the 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 Bangkok property market itself because I I've looked at the Bangkok property developer uh, stocks before and I analyze most of them. And I what I realized is that in 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 Bangkok itself, right, uh, it has an oversupply in in terms of the condominium itself. Mm. So all these condo, right, uh, so many condo and the locals don't even buy it, and the rental was so cheap as low as actually four hundred sing dollar a month oh, really and that's, that's really yeah. really very cheap okay and they are now coming in over to, to singapore and trying to sell you the the bangkok property itself so just take note that don't don't suck up to all these high yield property and they, they tell you you can buy it cheap and all this but but mm. just based go back to common sense again if the property is really good they won't come overseas the locals will snap it out already exactly. okay right so yeah this uh actually this is the end of all my uh, the sharing of all my mistakes but of course as you can see the quote here theodore roosevelt once said right the only man who never makes a mistake is the man who never does anything and because i simply tried i also have a couple of successes to yeah. share and i can show you these are two of my successful investments the first one is gnj i was talking just now yeah. i bought it at 92 bucks current price is 137. you still holding on no? yeah yeah, yeah i'm okay, holding yeah. So, yeah luckily i didn't sell right yeah. <laughs> So the dividend has increased yeah. about 30 over percent yeah. to 360 and yeah. I've made a total return of 61.9%. Based yeah. on plus dividend? Plus dividend yeah. and after, after the tax, tax So well. you invest in US, right, there's a 30% uh, dividend tax. Yeah. So not so bad for, uh, I think, a five years holding. Five years holding period. Uh, yeah. 61.9%. That's how uh, dividend investing usually, that's the, the percentage the that you'll get. Yeah. Right. So the other one is actually this company called WEC Energy. This is a utility with a stronghold in mm -hmm. Wisconsin. So again, like Kinder Morgan, it's a regulated mm -hmm. monopoly. Okay. So entry price was 45, mm -hmm. um, my current price like 78. And with the dividend increased, um, I think 40%, yeah. and my returns were 90%. So this is one of the better investments. Yeah. yeah. So I'm also just going to talk briefly about a couple of other successful mm -hmm. investments that I've made that I think are still pretty good, but except one. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll just talk about it. So the TJX, the, mm -hmm. this company is mm -hmm. actually the first company that I bought. Okay. This is an off-price retailer of apparel, mm -hmm. home decor, and furniture. So what they do is they sell these kind of things at about 20 to 60% discount to mm -hmm. customers. And the business model is actually very interesting. So what they do is they buy inventory mm -hmm. from departmental stores and mm -hmm. apparel manufacturers who have excess inventory and trying to clear stock. Okay. So what it does is it buys in this stock and then keeps it until the season is in, and then they sell it to customers at a profit. Okay. And the other thing is that it's a, quite a resilient business as well against Amazon mm -hmm. because of its experience on, of, uh, I mean, its emphasis mm -hmm. um, on the customer service. So what, what it likes is that when people come in the store, mm -hmm. they, they have like a kind of a treasure hunt feel because when, when it buys incomplete sets of inventory at, at cheap prices, right? Mm -hmm. um, when, when, when people come, they are like eager to try things on. Mm -hmm. uh, some clothes, you know, some may not be suitable, they have no size. Mm -hmm. And if they have no size, right, that means they really don't have any other stock. Okay. So it's very rare for them to find something that they really like. And when they find that, it's it's like finding treasure and, and okay. they'll, they'll buy it. So it's because of, of this whole customer experience that TJX focuses on. So it's actually performed very well. Okay. Um, the next one is Google. I mean, Google, I think, really needs no more yeah. explanation. It's so yeah. entrenched in our lives. Yeah. So it basically, has... there's one search engine only. Yeah, yeah, there's it, one that is really good. Like, who uses Bing, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it is. But besides, you know, the search engine, it's also built an entire application uh, ecosystem of yeah. different kinds of applications, mm. from things like YouTube um, to like Google Maps. Yeah, I cannot live without like Google Maps. Yeah, I can't yeah. live without Google Maps. Yeah. I think you you yeah. said well, in China. Well, right? I was in China. Well, yeah. Our Ruspin was in China. That's you cannot use Google Maps. It's like wow, it's terrible, man. Yeah. You have to use Python Map or something like. That. <laughs> and I think it's not as good, right? Definitely. Yeah, not. yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, Google is definitely something that yeah. is, is a really good um, stock to buy. Yeah. And the next one is actually Kimberly Clark. This one is a uh, manufacturer of tissue, toilet paper, and personal care. Yeah. And these are uh, personal care products. And these are things that we need in mm -hmm. both good and bad times, right? And what I bought into Kimberly Clark then was because um, of, of its share of mine, like J&J's consumer okay. brands. Mm -hmm. And But more importantly, um, because of its relationships with all the retailers, mm -hmm. it gives them a lot of shelf space okay. where, in, in the stores. But I've also recently sold this stock okay. because um, Kimberly Clark has been really good at cutting costs okay. and that's increased margins. But recently I found that Kimberly Clark's gross margins actually fell. Okay. So um, I, I sold it because uh, firstly, there's, there's a limit to how much you can okay. cut costs. And secondly, we are we are seeing a decrease in the unemployment rate. Okay. That means labor costs are about to go up. Okay. So I, I think Kimberly Clark doesn't 
also doesn't have that much mm-hmm. growth. So I decided to build a position okay. when Kimberly Clark's trading at that So are you still holding price. TJX and yeah, Google? Yeah, TJX and Google definitely. Still Those are okay. one, two of my core positions actually. Yeah. Actually, Google, I think he bought it at a very good price. What, yeah, what's your price? 600 plus. 600 plus. That was, that was a very good price. So I should wait told uh, Kangwei that, hey, please don't sell, <laughs> don't sell Google. Google is, uh, is one stock that you want to hold for life. Man. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So yeah, so that's the end. This is summary now. Um, I'm just gonna summarize this and yeah. also give you a couple of like tips, right? So um, the first one is that it's never too early or too late mm-hmm. to start investing. So for, for those of, for our young viewers, you know, mm-hmm. starting young is really, really beneficial mm-hmm. because you really have the time to fail and yeah. learn. And when you're young, you don't start that much capital. Yeah. yeah. And it's never too late as well because if you are just entering retirement, mm-hmm. um, instead of spending your funds, you should maybe consider dividend investing where, where you really can um, get um, uh, steady and reliable cash flows uh-huh. over time instead of spending your capital and then you have nothing left, yeah. right? And also, um, the, another tip, right, is that for investing, you really have to take time to, to understand mm-hmm. businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, because you, after all, you can see through this presentation, right, that it's not easy. You can do analysis and yet still lose money yeah but but the key is to just persist and also mm. be disciplined about it mm. um and just and just yeah. continue on don't be too fixated or getting 100 percent uh that means you make 100 percent right call okay most of the time i tell you, you you if you can get seven out of or six out of seven six to seven correct is is quite good already okay even uh personally i also make mistake in investing also mm. yeah. and lastly and the most important i think is that you should only invest money that you can lose or you don't need it yeah. in the near future. Because if you need this capital for something, mm. like let's say in five or 10 years, mm. and the market happens to crash at the yeah. point, and you, so you have to really sell out at yeah. that kind of low prices. Uh, which so, you're not supposed to sell. Uh. Yeah, and, and those are prices we're supposed to buy at, not sell, right? Yeah. So um, that's another tip I have. I, I just, just invest um, the capital that you are, you are okay with not having over okay. a long period of time. Okay, so uh, that's the end of the presentation. Yeah, okay. I'll be taking some questions. Okay, so what happened right now is that uh, you can ask us any question regarding the uh, the presentation, or you also can ask us any question regarding investing. I think okay. I see some questions there already, right? Yeah, of course. So, so give me a minute. Uh, we're just going to switch it to our face. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, I think you can see us I... now. So, so we're trying to. Get some questions. Oh, there's wow, a lot. A lot of questions. Okay, there's a there's a lot of question. If you if you have any question right now, please type. Uh, we'll go and answer the question for the next 10 uh to 15 minutes itself. Okay. Okay, yeah. Uh, so the first question is but US dividend is taxed heavily yeah. by US government. This is by Mr. Tan Kien yeah. Soon, right? Yeah. Yeah. So of course the US dividend is, is taxed heavily, it's 30%. Yeah. But for me, why I, I look at US dividend stocks is because I really like the kind of diversification yeah. that US dividend stocks came with. Yeah. Because in Singapore, many of the the blue chip stocks, yeah. um, even for those blue chip stocks, right? Okay. They are um, still relatively concentrated. Okay. But for J and J or for Nestle, uh, other mm-hmm. kinds of different mm-hmm. companies, mm-hmm. Um, they are really diversified across the whole world, and that's an like, extra protection. Mm-hmm. So I was like, uh, okay, like, I'm I'm willing to take okay. the thirty percent dividend okay. um, withholding tax mm-hmm. just to ex- to, okay. to get these businesses. Okay, so yeah. talk actually asked this question: Is it possible to download the video? Okay, I think we, you can't download download the video, but we have a site that we host this all this video after we're done. We have many episodes. The past episode is all down there. You just have to Google fifth person and hang out, then you can find the the site to go already. Okay. Okay, uh, the next one is um, Mr. Bar, um Will uh, the recent lawsuit affect J and J's dividend performance? Mm-hmm. And I think no, because J and J's dividend payout ratio is actually mm-hmm. just like fifty or sixty mm-hmm. percent. So that that's really low as compared to to the, its earnings. And for mm-hmm. and I think for the lawsuit, a lot of things mm-hmm. are like not really confirmed yeah. yet. Mm-hmm. And even if it is right, it'll just be a one-time charge. And I think J and J will be able to to just manage that. Okay. Take so, it in so I think that there's this next question by Peter Lai. He actually asked like, uh, where can you find uh, US, US company US info? company information? Uh? Yeah. So um the the first source and the most obvious source yeah. is, is the company's mm-hmm, website mm-hmm. You, you can find annual reports okay. and everything there mm-hmm. so definitely there's, there's somewhere that, yeah, that i think there's another one you can call is the s sec right sec, SEC yeah sec 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 uh, sec what's the website right? sec dot gov is it dot gov yeah, but, just, but anyway, it's the Securities Exchange Commission. Yeah, you just type US. SEC dot uh, SEC GOV. Just Google this. You'll go to this website. You can go there and find all the mm. ten case reports of this, like thank you or this yeah. insider buying and still what lah. Okay, bad. Uh, and my bad. Yeah, correct. So you can also 
if you want like a, a very quick and dirty like oh. um, view yeah. of the company, you yeah. can go to like companies like uh, Seeking Alpha. Okay. Um, they will have analysis of the companies. Okay, so actually Alicia asked, uh, like, um, how how do you buy US stock when you are actually? Yeah, I, I use my father's um. So basically, uh, account, use his father's basically. account. Yeah. So the father actually opens an account for him to 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 trade itself. Okay. Uh, how to reinvest your dividends from Alicia as well? Um, for for the broker I use is called Shao Show Up. Um, they actually have a function just reinvest the dividends. So I just click yes. And the next uh, one, you ask, yeah, actually some, uh, Jacqueline actually asked is, do you invest in Singapore stock and what is your take on the upcoming uh, market bullish okay. or bearish or? <laughs> okay, I, I think the bullish or bearish yeah. part is a bit hard to answer because yeah. I, I mean, predict, I already shared, Basically, right? we can't predict the Yeah, the we, can't, we can't really uh, predict. I, I'm only going to look into like good stocks. I, yeah, I, I, I've started investing in Singapore stocks as well. A couple of them that I bought is like um, Comfort Delgro, when, 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 the Grab and Uber thing okay. was actually impacting it. The stock price crashed. So okay. yeah, it's something about. I think Adrian have a very interesting uh question. He says, "See, my daughter is watching this, and she's in secondary school. Second, secondary, secondary two. two. Okay. So secondary two is about fourteen years yeah, old. Yeah, that right? is the time. That, yeah. So she's asking, what is the first thing she should uh start doing now? First thing that she should start doing now is. Because for for me, I just started online. I just Google stock um how to invest in stocks and all that. So um. I, I think you can go to a, the couple of sites that we were talking mm -hmm. about just now, like, yeah. like, like Seeking Alpha, and also definitely yeah. um, read books. So um, I think the most um, common book that we always uh, talk about is like some of the things like huh. Peter Lynch. I, I okay. actually recommend One Up on Wall Street. Okay. That was a that's pretty good book that really teaches you how to find like fundamentally strong businesses. But of course, there's like Benjamin Graham's The Intelligent Investor okay. as well. That's a pretty yeah, yeah solid book as well. So I think Lin, Lin Yip actually asked this uh, I think it's a very good question. Is which website or app do you use to actually filter, filter your criteria? Yeah, right? so for US stocks, I use this yeah. app site called Finviz, F I N V I Z dot com. Um, it actually is the best free screener that I've found so far. But of course, you can also use your brokerage, your brokerage screener. That one also usually has a lot of functions. Okay, uh, I think there's a question by SW. He asks, do you opt for a drip for all stocks or you take the dividend in cash or reinvest? Okay, so um, for Normally, right, I will set it as yes, unless I I reinvest it, unless um, I think that the stock price is overvalued and I think I can allocate yeah. my capital a bit better. Yeah. And for US stocks, it's okay to just reinvest because you can sell mm -hmm. those decimal places, like yeah. those fractional stocks easily. But for Singapore, better I recommend do that you don't do this. Yeah. Yeah. For Singapore, you must take uh, cash because you will end up in Yeah, for Singapore, cash, okay. definitely. Yeah. Because in US, they go by... Uh, 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 go by a uh, share itself itself also also remember only to do that if you feel that the stock is still undervalued then you mm. use the trick okay uh let me get another question here uh victor actually asks uh victor. what's the greatest uh lesson that you learned from investment journey and from which stock that you learn it well the greatest because there, there are so many lessons yeah. right um the the the, the greatest lesson uh, mm. I think it's never hold an over leveraged business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I actually shared that earlier. And because over leveraged business, right, no matter how strong a business is, it can be very stable, very recurring, like like a Kinder Morgan, but you still can, you, you still see mm -hmm. this kind of stocks possibly go mm -hmm. bankrupt because of the high debt load, because they just mm -hmm. uh, overestimated their ability to um, mm -hmm. manage this, this debt load Okay. In, in the face of a recession. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think uh YK have a question is currently DKSH is buying Auric. Mm. Uh, I think this I think this question I can answer it. Uh is gearing is a, a go above one is is this still undervalued or generating a good deal for upcoming acquisition? Personally, I think that they are the management is taking too much risk in acquiring the the Auric and they are taking too much debt to mm. acquire. So I, I got very concerned with that the issue uh, uh with with this company DKSH at this moment. Okay. Mm. Uh and also I think that there's a lot of people asking about the brokerage account that uh yeah. is using. Uh, so I'm actually using Charles Show Up because uh, the minimum is 25 grand USD. Okay. I like interactive brokers like 100 uh, grand something yeah, like that. But in, uh but interactive brokers generally you must have a lot of money then yeah, use interactive yeah. broker. If not you can use Charles Swap or if not you can yeah, use iFast I think I fast also yeah. uh, there's also a lot of other US brokers mm. like Thing of Swim, T D Ameritrade, uh, E E Trade, uh, actually Option Express or something. Option like Express that. is now Charles Shop actually. Oh, uh, now Charles Shop. Yeah, oh, it's Option Express. Okay, <laughs> they basically been bought over by. Yeah, they uh, bought over Charles Shop. Okay. And uh, I, 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 wait, okay. Okay. Uh, how how about positive net, net cash, cash company? company? I mean, as in what what context is it? Of course, you having a net cash company is good. I would say I would say uh, 
Yeah, and then I, I see this question. I'm holding Hatton Land Try Cut Loss yeah. since it's lumpy in your sharing, right? Yeah, okay. So I, I think that you should, it's really based on your position size. If it's too big, I recommend that you trim it. But if it's small, like, like mine, actually, I haven't sold it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, la. if it's small, I, I think it's okay. Kelvin asks, uh, were you born in yes, 1988? Yes, 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 it's born That's in right. 1988. <laughs> you guessed it, 1988. Uh, okay, yeah. So, uh, Peter Lai actually asked where to find the insider trade. So um, normally you can find it in the SEC website, uh, but for Finvis, they actually at the bottom of each stock profile you can find the insider trades. Mm -hmm. I actually use that. Yeah. Okay, let me see. What is GNJ undervalued now? I think it's fairly valued. Okay. Uh, how do you discipline? Wait, wait, yeah. Regarding about market noise, how do you determine when to ignore and when to take action? So Bo Boeing, for example. Okay. So for for market noise, firstly. Yeah. You must you, you must determine whether mm -hmm. it, it actually like like uh -huh. makes sense, mm -hmm. and also uh whether the stock is undervalued and this market noise is like causing your stock to 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 depreciate okay. lower than, than its fair value. So okay. um if you think that the stock has really gone down and then the market noise is causing mm -hmm. this stock to go down further, that might be a good opportunity. And but of course you you can't ignore all market noise because some of them they they actually make sense. But currently for example for the Boeing market noise. Like nothing has actually been mm -hmm. found. The CEO is mm -hmm. not really willing to put himself in the spotlight as well because mm -hmm. uh, nothing has really been mm -hmm. proved. So mm -hmm. for for this kind of thing, I, I think it, you it, still it, have to wait. I think. Yeah. yeah. So um, I, I I think you really have to like differentiate like, Okay. Uh, over there, yeah. So is Finvis? Uh, yes, free? Finvis is free, free except for the premium functions, which are like real time stock codes mm -hmm. and exporting and like back testing. But those kind of things, I think we as retail investors don't really need unless you're like like doing some yeah. some hedge running some hedge fund or something. Then maybe yeah. you can go for that. But okay. it's quite expensive. Yeah. Ah, uh, so is Sexo. Capital market suitable for trading US Yeah, stock. actually one of my colleagues, Kenny, he yeah, actually uses our, Sexo. One of our, our colleague, Kenny, is using Sexo. Yeah, capital. so I, I heard it's like $3 USD per, per trade. So that, that's pretty attractive. And you actually get to trade on a lot of different countries. For show up, you only get US. Yeah, yeah you only get US. IFAS, only US, Hong Kong, Singapore. Okay, so uh, I think Kaida actually asked, is the tax dividend the same for buying individual and also with companies? The same actually. Okay, uh, with private company, yeah, if I, you, you have to check the, yeah. the double tax avoidance treaties. Yeah. Because a private company, you may also need to tax again. Uh, yeah, but uh, I, I think for some private companies, it may be lower, like 10, 15, but you have to check. Yeah, have to check. Yeah. Uh, Somebody asked, do you have a website or a blog? I used to write about Seeking Alpha, yeah. and yeah. a very, very long time ago, I used to, to just write, maintain a blog, but currently I'm like interning with the fifth person, so I yeah. write for them. So you write for the fifth person? Yeah, so you can find some articles on their website. So SM actually asked, hey, do you have SG read? I currently have not gone to read because I'm yeah. kind of like unfamiliar yeah. with, with the kind You're of still learning risk from yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm learning risk from them, like dividend machines, yeah. Course, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so Alan asked actually, do should we use long-term long -term option one or two in the US? Okay, stock? the only long-term options that I will recommend is to sell puts. So you determine the price that you want to buy the stock at, and then you sell put options um, so that you can buy it at a lower cost. And for, for those that are not really familiar, um when you sell puts you collect the premium and and then uh when the stock price goes below that strike price you get to you you, you get the stock uh um, yeah. you get the stock purchase but, but i think the option itself is quite high level itself like, it's quite high level yeah, yeah so so if you are quite new to investing I, 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 my suggestion is you yeah. don't go into option itself I, personally i also don't know what's and, i and, never use options yeah so. and then just one interesting fact is that 80 percent of options expire worthless so you're better off on the other side of the trade, selling yeah. options, right? So somebody asked actually, uh, Berkshire company owns by Warren Buffett does not pay dividend. Other yeah, because yeah. Than that one time. So what is, what yeah, is with the attraction? attraction. Yeah. So for Berkshire, I think he's been really pro proven to be such a fantastic capital allocator. He's been reinvesting in all the right places. Of course, he makes his mistakes. I mean, everyone does. But he, the returns over so long, um, over the, I think, 40, 50 years, yeah. and he's been so consistent. So people really want to have a share of that. Yeah. I mean, Berkshire the way that itself, it was a it was a one once a shell company mm. making textiles, mm. and now it's like the fifth largest company by market cap in the yeah. world. So you can see the fantastic performance of Warren Buffett. So I think that's where the attraction comes from. Yeah, I think we're going to answer another one or two questions, then we're going to call it a day. So I think David Tong actually asked about the Chinese banks listed in the Hong Kong uh, exchange, such as Bank of China, ICBC, CCB, mm. are all very attractive price recently. I I don't I don't know how you. You you mean by attractive? Maybe it's by the price to book value. Uh, so my my take is that actually the the, the I think there's a lot of shadow banking happening in in China. That's why the, mm -hmm. the and also the the banks are taking more risk in, in terms of lending out money and 
And I, I think the government is also clamping down on a lot of issues. That, that, that's why the banks are, are going down. But I, I, I don't know how, how safe is the China bank. But generally, the Singapore bank is generally uh, much safer itself, I would say. And what broker is recommend to buy uh, Hong Kong stock? Of course, if you were to go to Hong Kong itself uh, to open a bro brokerage account over there, it's, it's, it's better, it's cheaper. If not, I think you go through a uh, local broker like IFAS, it's, it's much cheaper in terms of uh, trading. Hong I'll Kong. just go into some of the, the question I can answer in like one sentence, yeah. right? Before yeah. buying shares, do you calculate intrinsic value? Yes, I do. Um, what's the most important investment book? Um, I would say one of on Wall Street has is really influential, mm -hmm. but I also like this book that I recently read called Hundred Bankers by Chris Mayer. Yeah. Uh, okay. So Alan actually asked you. Okay, these are going to be the last question. So Alan asked, what's your recent interesting article written on the fifth person worth reading? What is okay? I I think one is of of course the one uh, on IFRS sixteen. Yeah. That's the latest article that's actually okay. posted. It's based on recent accounting changes that okay. is going to take place um beginning fiscal twenty nineteen. So I think as investors, we, we really need to, to keep in touch with all this kind of stuff. So definitely it's uh, yeah. worth reading, yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you so much for attending this uh, monthly webinar again. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the end of today's webinar. So if you really like and uh, like us on this webinar, please go into the fifth person um, email list so we can update mm -hmm. you with any future webinar and all this. So if not, I thank you so much and yeah, that, thanks, that, thanks everyone yeah, for so, listening. So, I really had a great time. So like, we're going to see you uh, next month. Yeah, itself. see you okay. next month. Thank you. Thanks.